Hello, dear friends, here we are. It's midnight here in the East Coast of the United States and probably some other time elsewhere, but it doesn't matter what's important, we are together. Hello, friends. Hi, Silvia. Hi, Kasia. Tanya and Joyce and Josada. Thank you, friends. We are together. Remember, we are together cherishing these beautiful lessons, beautiful lessons that were granted to us by the loving spirits that coordinate the efforts on the earth, guided by Jesus. 30 days of lessons, of good news with the Master, Master Jesus. Can't get better than that. And you know, for those who are getting in right now, let me share with you the mentors of Kardec Radio, the Spiritist Son of Virginia, they kindly asked us after the 2016 elections in the United States, they said, Vanessa, let's study Paul and Stephen and the Book Good News together and share the study with everyone. Let us raise our optimism. Let us raise our levels of uh, kindness as well. And did you know that Emmanuel has a beautiful message in the book Living in Spring that goes hand in hand with it? He says to us, it's chapter 137, he says that uh, Jesus came, Jesus came, not so we get stuck in this religious thought, like the one that is like, you know, hierarchical, etc., but to work on our human goodness. That's all that is. So, we are now receiving this good news. Are you ready for today? Remember we, yesterday we were talking about how do you feel when somebody says, I'm going to give you some good news. <laughs> what is your first reaction? I was asking Carlos the other day. He's so funny. He's like, okay, Vanessa, give me the good news. And I said, what is your reaction? It varies, of course. Each person is different, but it's important for us to feel this good news. It's not about knowing, oh my gosh, I know so much about the scriptures. Like Nicodemus, he knew it all. Big deal. Jesus told him, you forgot to feel, Nicodemus. Have we forgot to feel? Maybe, maybe, yeah, 2,000 years went by. Yeah, I love Jesus, but I don't feel it. But now, thanks to Chico Xavier, thanks to Umberto de Campos, to Emmanuel, many others, we can feel it. Oh, yeah, Spiritism is amazing. So we yesterday talked about the preface of the book Good News and Chapter 1. The book is translated into English and awaits its publication. It's already at the hands of the President of the Brazilian Spiritist Federation and we trust that sooner or later everyone is going to be able to receive this book because after all it's already in Spanish, even in Finnish, but in English, come on. We need it, please, right? Hi, Adilson, Rita de Cassia, Says, uh, thank you so much, friends. So now chapter two. Beautiful, beautiful. We're talking about two moms today. Uh-huh. Talking about feeling. The feelings of moms. You know? It begins. Chapter two. Jesus and the precursor. <gasps> what is this? It begins. Let us listen. Because Umberto de Campos, his way of writing it. It's, it's, it's a masterpiece. It's so beautiful. It's poetic at times. His narrative, it's so deep. And he brings elements that are unprecedented. Let us listen, right? After the famous introduction of Jesus to the doctors in the temple of Jerusalem, Mary was visited by Isabel and her son, in Mary's humble little house in Nazareth. Here we have many elements, right? Many elements to discuss. Remember, Jesus was a teenager, like preteen teenage years, right? And he 
is introduced to the doctors in the synagogue in Jerusalem. They go back to Nazareth. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, lives in a humble little house. Pause. Feeling. This description is not personal. Oh, she lived in a little house. No, no. Feel it. She, the mother of Jesus Christ. The Messiah expected by everyone. For us, we know he's the governor of the planet. He lived in a little house in Nazareth. How do you feel about it? That's our first quiz of the day. Because we need to feel it in order to understand his coming. He lived in a little house in Nazareth. What does that mean? Was he plain humble? No. But for us, we need to feel. When, as Chico Xavier used to say, not only about spirit centers, but for our families as well. When the house grows too big, love disappears. We need to be like cozy together. I'm not saying like tied up together, but you know, closer. These big homes. I already moved from a big home. I said, Carlos, thank you very much, but no thank you. I don't like big homes. It doesn't make any sense. We're too far from one another. And you know, today I was reading a research that was just released. Thank you for the love, friends. We all feel it. And the research says in psychology that when people feel lonely, they feel lonely, not because they are alone, but because they lack the closeness to people. It's not about having friends. It's about how close we are to people. How close are we to people? How close? Are we close? Let's meditate. How close are we to people? No wonder people are feeling so lonely. Because we have relationships, but we're afraid of being too close. And you know why? Because we get to be hurt by those that are the closest to us. Don't be afraid. Jesus wasn't afraid. He was not afraid of being close. He was not afraid at all. Though he knew where he was coming to. But... Are we afraid of being too close? We need to. For example, in our relationships at home, in our communities, don't feel like, oh, I'm so silly, I'm stupid. Some people say, see, I'm stupid. I give of myself and people always take it for granted. Don't take offense. It's people's issues. We trust. We open our heart. Whatever they're going to do with it, the heart is in their hands, but you, you still keep yours inside, right? <laughs> you give your heart, copy. <laughs> you keep yours inside, meaning you open up. But it does, you multiply your love. That's what I mean. When you copy, I'm saying you multiply it. You send it out without fear. We'll never lose anything by trusting. Like Jesus trusted everyone. He trusted Judas too. Though he knew Judas was in training and he was not complying with the coaching program, let's say this way. But anyhow, Jesus invested and kept investing. And even after the facts, he kept investing and still does to date. Jesus keeps coaching us and trying again and again and again and again and again. What a message. Hmm? So they are there. And Isabel is the cousin of Mary. Her son is John the Baptist. Uh-huh, exactly. After the usual greetings during the discussion of family affairs, the two cousins, Mary and Isabel, started to talk about their children, whose births were preceded by remarkable events and surrounded by unusual circumstances. You see, they were 
normal matters. They talked about their children. They were not like, oh, we don't need to talk about them because they are sent by God. The angels already told it. And that's how some people play. When they know that their children have some extra gifts, they're like, no, nah, I don't need to worry because, no, no. If we love, we are focused. We do what we need to do. We don't delegate to anybody. It's our task. If you're a mother, if you're a father, it's your task. Until they become a certain age, and then we change the role. It doesn't mean we're not no longer parents. We change, we transform the interaction. As much as when somebody discarnates, we change the interaction with them, the dynamics. But that relationship still goes on, right? So they talked about it while the patriarch Joseph, father of Jesus, attended to the last daily needs of their humble workshop. He was telling about the dynamics of home. The two mothers entertained themselves with the conversation, affectionately confining their dearest motherly concerns. See how love Humberto de Campos is, my friends. He's telling us, telling us, Hi, Norman, you leader, sunshine, Aidan. Good morning, you're funny, Aidan. <laughs> and Rita de Cassia. You see, beautiful way of describing the dearest motherly concerns. Nowadays, parents are afraid of being concerned about their children. They think it's shameful. Even in the United States, people are like, no, my child is independent. Let them do this. Let, and they are just two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old. Like, Please, they are independent, but now they depend on you. <laughs> don't delegate that. Please don't, right? Yes, we feel the love of mothers. So important. That role is not possible to be delegated. We can't. What amazes me, said Isabel, let's listen to the dialogue. It's beautiful. Many lessons. What amazes me, said Isabel, with a loving smile, so we can picture, projecting your screen in front of you, the dialogue, because Umberto de Campos paints the whole scenario, and we can see it. With a loving smile, Isabel was saying, What amazes me is John's temperament, John the Baptist. Given to the deepest meditations, despite his young age. Often I search for him at home in vain. Then I find him almost always among the sycamores, or walking along the scorching hot roads, as if his mind were dominated by deep thoughts. Ah, we are learning a lesson here. St. Augustine, in the Gospel According to Spiritism, chapter 14, item 9. Very wisely, he says, study your child from the get-go, the crib, for us we can study when we are gestating them too. We can feel more than anyone else who it, the Spirit is. And we better know ourselves so we can know, we can get to know who they are. The difference between what is ours and what is the baby's. So, St. Augustine says, study, because you see the tendencies from the very beginning at a cradle. And here we have a teenager in his first years of his teenage years, already showing, already showing his past lives acquisitions let's say this this way acquisitions virtues blossoming often people talk about adolescence in the negative spiritism restores adolescence for us let us stop this story about adolescence being a curse i was an adolescent adolescent you were not necessarily we're troubled. It varies. But if we project 
our child is going to be troubled. We're pushing them to trouble. Look around. You know, every time you get a spirit book, did you know that the mediums were teenagers? Quite young, by the way. They were teenagers. All the books you get from Kardec, teenage mediums. Blessed teenagers. And you think they are the only ones? Chico Xavier began at 17, Divaldo Franco at 17. He started the Mission of the Way when he was 20, together with Uncle Nielsen. And we have many people around the world who start good deeds when they are quite young. Look at Arodo Dutra Dias, for those who know him, he's a Brazilian speaker, and he began quite young, and many people here as well, they started quite young. And we need to use spiritism as an inspiration to redefine adolescence on the earth, okay? Because it can be quite blessed. Look at Gioni Correa is here, and she agrees, you know why? I have to say this, I know... The adorable little Vanessa. No, she's not so little now. Aluisa and Johnny, I know them. I met Vanessa, the little one, who is now 21, when she was three, almost four. And uh, believe it or not, she's a wonderful, a wonderful lady, young lady. She went through adolescent years without any event. Adorable very strong, wonderful parents, very caring, very loving. That's the secret too. Forgive me, no judgment, but we're just saying, let's trust adolescents. Because our friends here are telling us, John the Baptist was an adolescent. He already had these good impulses he acquired from previous lives, right? Tanya Stewart is telling us she started when she was 15. You see, here we go, friends. Now, what does Mary say? Are you curious about Mary? Me too, Mary. Let's hear from her. She's talking about our master. These children, in my view, replied Mary, the soft gleam of her eyes intensifying, so we can picture. In my view, these children bring the divine light of a new path to humanity. My son, too, is like that. So he's saying that Jesus is like that, very reflective, meditating, and he causes me constant concern because <laughs> he's different. And even Mary, in spite of everything, she was concerned. Sometimes I find Jesus alone by the waters, other times in deep conversation with the travelers, heading to Samaria or to the remote villages near the lake. Usually, I hear his charitable words towards the washerwomen, the passers-by, to the suffering beggars. He speaks of his communion with God with an eloquence that I never found in the observations of our wise men, and I worry constantly about his fate. How moving is this? This is our master in his childhood, in his preteen, teenage years. That's how he was. Next time you want to know what he, he did, here we have a summary. Here we have a summary. What did he used to do? He was like meditating by the waters or in deep conversations with everyone indistinctively of what the person was. And he was always charitable in his words. Oh, it, it doesn't surprise us, does, does it? Of course it makes sense. It makes sense. He is the master. He would bring about that loving attitude from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Remember, yeah, you feel the love too, me too. We're getting to know a little more about our master. And these revelations by the spirits are telling us about giving tips for all of us, about 
doing the childhood, the importance of childhood. If we see little things, let's correct with love. Let's make adjustments. Do not let the little things go by freely. No, no, no. We need to lovingly go down and... Ch -ch -ch. Like, you know, sculptures? We sculpt in the details. We're sculpting our children. Because actually they're not ours. But in this case... She's saying, you know, he talks about things I've never heard, even from the wisest men. But I, as a mother, worry about his fate. Isn't she funny? I'm saying funny in a very respectful way, because Ma Mother Mary is adorable. Despite all the values of faith, murmured Isabel with conviction, we mothers always have our spirit shaped.